Well, good morning. It's good to see you all today. And we apologize for the projector being out. That just happened this morning. So a little disillusioned about that. It's only been like uh, a year and a half since we got the new projector. The last one lasted seven or eight years. So go figure. You know, things don't last like they used to, I guess. But we'll try to get a new bulb as quickly as we can. Today we're talking about uh, being faithful to the Lord. So pull out your outline if you have one. Faithfully following the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you all to try and be here next Sunday. We've got a special service planned for next Sunday. We have a traveling group of senior adult ladies that are on a tour. It's their Pacific Northwest tour. And so they're headed up to Washington State and California and they're going to go to like 35 different uh, venues and many, many churches. And so they asked if they could stop off here and, and uh, worship with us this coming Sunday morning. And so I've watched some of their video and everything is really good. And uh, I can tell they have a lot of fun and uh, very much about leading the church in worship and praising the Lord. So I hope you'll be here next Sunday morning for that very special uh, worship service. Also next Sunday morning, we're going to share the Lord's Supper, communion together, uh, probably before the, the ladies uh, lead us in worship. So I hope you can be here for that as well. So next Sunday will be a kind of an exciting day and something kind of different here at uh, Lifeway Fellowship. I hope you can be a part of that. Well, in the Gospel of Mark, we've seen already two occasions where the Lord Jesus told his disciples what was about to happen to him. This is getting close to the end of his ministry and so he knows that the time is very close for him to go to Jerusalem during Passover and to be sacrificed as our Passover lamb as a sacrifice for our sins and so Jesus uh, in Mark 8 pulls his disciples aside and explains to them what's going to happen verse 31 it says he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed, and after three days, rise again. And so Jesus tells them, you know, what's coming, this is about to take place. You remember on one occasion, Peter kind of got him aside and say, said, Lord, if this is going to happen to you, we've got to stop this. You, you can't let this happen. And it's because he loved him so much. He didn't understand, of course, fully recognize and realize that, that Jesus had to do this, that he had to go to the cross for our sins to be atoned for, for us to have forgiveness of sin. And so you can imagine how the disciples must have felt. They loved Jesus very much. They were very much like a family. They'd spent three years together now, traveling all over Israel together. And they loved him so much. And so this was a very, very difficult thing for his disciples to, to comprehend and to accept that Jesus had to die. But he says, I'm going to rise again after three days. And then in Mark chapter 9, verse 31, he repeats this to him again. He said, The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days, he will rise. And so one thing that really speaks to my heart about the message this morning is the perfect example that Jesus sets for us about being faithful. God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, was on a mission, having been sent by God the Father to come to this world, and to ultimately go to the cross and to make the ultimate sacrifice, to lay down his life for all of us. And so he sets the perfect example for us of faithfulness and obedience to do exactly what God had instructed him to do. And so he's a good example for all of us of what it means to be faithful in following him. And so I hope that that's what you'll, you'll gain from this this morning, as I have, that the Lord loves us so much, and He wants so many good things for us. He wants us to have a full and abundant life. He wants us to, to enjoy our lives to the fullest. And a big, big part of that, of course, is being very, very faithful in obedience to Him. Everything that He calls upon us to do. Sometimes uh, the Lord may uh, guide us and instruct us to do something that we don't fully understand. You ever had that experience? Where you really felt strongly in your heart and soul that the Lord is leading you in a certain direction to do something or to make a decision of some kind. And it may not make a whole lot of sense to you. It may be troubling to you. It may be, be scary to you. And yet you hopefully went through with that and you were obedient to do what uh, God was leading you to do. And when you do that, you receive tremendous joy and blessings and 
satisfaction and fulfillment in your heart, right? And so that's happened to me many, many times where the Lord has, has helped me to get through a difficult time, uh, maybe something I didn't understand or leading me to do something that I was afraid to do. And yet when I was faithful to do that, I reaped a great benefit from that, a great blessing. And so I want you to think about that this morning, being faithful to the Lord, having really a time of personal revival in your life. I really believe that we all go through ups and downs in our lives, don't we? In all areas of our lives, you know, different areas that you go through, whether it's work or family or whatever, and also in your spiritual life. We all have ups and downs. Sometimes we're up, sometimes we're down. Sometimes we're excited, sometimes we're depressed. Sometimes we're optimistic, sometimes we're discouraged, right? We all go through moments of ups and downs. And so all of us strive to be up as often as we can. And that just makes sense. That's a common sense thing. And so I think the same thing is true in the spiritual life. We want to be up as often as we can. We want to do the things we can to be close to the Lord, to be obedient to the Lord, and to be faithful in all that He wants us to do. And so sometimes we call that having a spiritual awakening or a revival, a personal revival in your own heart, being revived. And so uh, Jesus shows us how to do that this morning, I believe, because he's on an incredibly difficult assignment here to go to the cross, and yet he teaches us what it's about to be faithful and to be obedient to do God's will. So if you want to have a new beginning this morning with the Lord, maybe you're not up here where you'd like to be spiritually. If you want to have a, 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 a personal revival in your heart, a kind of a new beginning with the Lord spiritually this morning, there are three things that always take place when that occurs in a, in a person's life. First of all, there has to be a time of repentance, a moment of repentance in your life. The word repent means to turn. And so you're turning away from something and you're turning to something or someone. And so repentance in the Bible means to turn away from sin or turn away from apathy, turn away from indifference, turn away from unfaithfulness, and to turn towards the Lord. And to be faithful to Him, to be obedient to Him, and, and to do everything you can to focus your life on His perfect will. And so it begins with repentance. Maybe you need to repent of something this morning. There's something you need to turn away from, and there's someone you need to turn to, the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, there, there's this op opportunity for renewal that takes place. Spiritual awakening that occurs in your life. And after you make the decision to repent of sin and repent of apathy and things like that, there needs to be this time of, of spiritual awakening and renewal in your life where you're really thinking about the things of God. It's a time in your life when you're really optimistic about studying the Word of God and spending time in prayer and worshiping with brothers and sisters in Christ, really being involved in, in ministry. And that's the main aspect of your life. And so you go through this, this time of renewal. And this can happen quickly or it may take some time. And then thirdly, of course, you have this recommitment to the Lord. Where you really refocus on serving Him and being obedient to Him. And so maybe that needs to occur in your life this morning. All of us go through these moments where we really need a time of spiritual renewal or spiritual awakening. Churches have revivals, right? Countries Nations have spiritual awakenings, spiritual revivals that take place. And it's when we go through this process of repentance and renewal and recommitment that we see these great, great movements of the Lord in a person's life or in a church or even in a country. And so we certainly need that now, don't we? We really need a time of spiritual awakening and renewal in our country. And it could begin with all of us this morning. It really could to, to be really focused on God's will. So think about that this morning as we go through this message. Now, as I mentioned here, twice already Jesus has told his disciples about what's going to happen to him. They're, they're about to go to Jerusalem now for the last time, and he's going to offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. So he's informed them of this on a couple of occasions already. And then we get into chapter 10, and we see that he does it for a third time. Look at verse 32. It says, They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way, and it says the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. So you got this astonishment and this fear that's kind of combined with them going up to Jerusalem. It says, again, he took the twelve aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We're going up to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. 
They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. And so again, the third time, at least the third time, Jesus tells his disciples again in detail exactly what is about to happen. Now we know that that the Lord prevented them from having full comprehension of all these things until after the resurrection of Christ. But he, he very, 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 very uh, clearly explained to them what was going to happen to him. So they had that in the back of their mind. And then when the time came for them to have full understanding, they could have remembrance of everything the Lord had told them. And so they know clearly that this is going to happen to him. And so we see three things really that speak to my heart this morning about what Jesus did and how, how he set such a good example for us about being faithful to what God wants you to do. And the first one has to do with determination. I think faithfulness always requires determination to achieve some kind of a goal. He says we're going up to Jerusalem. It says that, that Jesus is leading the way. And, and it says that, that, that they were astonished. So you have to kind of look at the context. What are they astonished about? What, what is so amazing to them? I think it's the fact that Jesus was absolutely determined to go to Jerusalem knowing that he was about to be put to death. Now that takes a lot of courage, doesn't it? Yes, Jesus is the Son of God, but he, he's also fully human, right? And so he has the same emotions, the same feelings that we experience. And so we know that he experienced fear in the Garden of Gethsemane for sure. And so we know that he must have had this, these things going on in his heart and soul, uh, you know, apprehension about what was about to happen to him. And yet he was determined to do exactly what God the Father had sent him to do. He's not going to turn away from that. Now it was tough. It was difficult for him. We know that. The Bible says when he was in the garden that, uh, that he was in agony out of fear. And the Bible says he sweat as if it were drops of blood because he was so fearful about what was to happen to him and what was about to come. And, and he said, Father, if there's any other way, if there's any way that, that this could be averted, then, then let it be. You know, do, do I have to drink from this cup? And he said, nevertheless, your will be done and not mine. He knew, of course, that this was the only way that our sins could be forgiven. So I want you to understand and appreciate that this morning, that this was a very fearful and difficult thing for the Lord to do, and yet he was determined to go through with it. Nothing and no one was going to stop him from going to Jerusalem and going to the cross and experiencing all these things that he knew so very well were going to happen to him. And he did all of that because he loves you so much. He loved us so much that he laid down his life for you and for me. And so we can really appreciate how much the Lord loves us and what he's willing to do for us. Now, determination is very important in anything, achieving any kind of a goal. But determination does at least a couple of things. First of all, it, it kind of overcomes apathy, this feeling of indifference or having an apathetic attitude about things. Uh, sometimes we just get kind of, kind of apathetic about life, don't we? You ever get kind of apathetic about your job? We all, we all go through that, don't we? Let me let you in on a secret. Even preachers go through that, right? Sometimes we get apathetic about it. Sometimes we just have a hard time staying motivated to do what we know we need to do. And so when you're determined, for whatever reason, whatever, whatever creates the determination is another factor, but when you're determined to achieve something, then that, that helps you overcome that apathy, that attitude of indifference about it. You're really focused on what you need to do because it's really, really important to you. And so determination is very important in overcoming that apathetic attitude. It also helps us overcome the fear that we may have. Sometimes we're afraid to do something. Sometimes we're apprehensive about what's going to happen. We're, we're scared about doing something. And yet if we're convinced that it's what we need to do or what we have to do, that will help us overcome that fear, right? I remember years ago when we, we loaded up our family and moved to Fort Worth to go to seminary. That was one of the most fearful times in my life. I was really afraid because I didn't have much promise of what was going to happen in the way of income. And uh, I've always been one that's very, very concerned about having the income for my family and all of that. And at that time we had a six-year-old and a four-year-old and here we're going to just load up the truck and move to, to Fort Worth and move into the seminary housing. And 
I did have a job, but they told me it was only good for about six weeks, and then they didn't know what was going to happen. And so I was very, very apprehensive about that. I was scared. And yet I knew in my heart that this is what God wanted us to do. And Charlotte was more than willing to, to do this as well. And so we just went. We just went and trusted in the Lord and, and never looked back. The Lord's always provided for us and took care of us. And so sometimes you go through an experience like that when you're scared or you're fearful or you're, you're apathetic about something. But when you're determined to do it, when you realize that this is what I have to do, this is what God has called me to do, whatever it may be, that's going to help you get over the hump. That's going to help you to deter, you know, to be, to be faithful in serving the Lord and to achieve what He wants you to do. So determination is, is very, very important. Jesus was determined to do that. I suspect they could see the determination in His face as they're headed for Jerusalem. That's why they were astonished. They couldn't believe this. Well, man, He's just, He's determined to do this. You know, He knows what's going to happen to Him. He's told us that He's going to be put to death, and yet He is absolutely resolute in going forward with this. And that had to inspire them. Later, you think that might have inspired them to be faithful themselves? To remember what Jesus did when they were with Him. Now there are all kinds of areas where faithful determination is, is, is required, where it's very, very important. I mentioned your job. Your job certainly is something that you have to be determined to, uh, to be successful at. All of us get discouraged from time to time and, and uh, you may really, really love your job, or maybe you don't love it so much, you know. But it's important, right? It, it meets a, a very important need in your life. And so sometimes, sometimes you're just determined, I've got to do this. I've got to get up and go to work. I've been there, right? Even years ago, before I went into the ministry, I know what it's like to, the alarm to go off, and you really don't want to do this. You know, you're kind of tired of this. And yet, you know that it's important because you've got to provide for your family or whatnot. So you get up and you go, right? So your job is one area that uh, requires determination. Another would be school. Many of you, you know, going through school and, and things like that, understand how difficult it can be to, uh, you know, to, to achieve uh, an education and to be faithful to do that. Uh, you know, I remember when I was going through college and seminary, that I would kind of look at every semester as a new beginning. Because you get kind of discouraged, you get kind of tired, you get kind of burned out of doing school work after a while. And it's kind of hard to re-motivate re yourself to do that. And so I would kind of look at every semester as, as a new beginning. I got a new semester here and put everything else behind me now and I'm going to try and do even better this next semester and, and just kind of see that as a goal. Each semester just kind of one step at a time to get through that. Uh, I didn't know when I got out of high school that I'd even go to college. You know, that was before the Lord called me into the ministry, and, and I didn't know much about it, frankly. You know, I really didn't. I didn't even know what a bachelor's degree was. I mean, I, I knew people go to college and stuff, but I just didn't know much about that. I didn't have a whole lot of interest in that. But when the Lord called me into the ministry, suddenly it became very important to me, and I began to think about those things and to look into them a little deeper and all of that, and so... I decided that's what I need to do. I feel like this is what God wants me to do. And so when I had that, that determination to do it, it made all the difference in the world. Suddenly I began to plan and to work towards that and to achieve one goal at a time. And I was determined to make that happen. And so many of you have done the very same thing. Isn't it a great thing when you finish, finish school, at least one, one portion of school or whatnot, and you have this commencement service? Commence means to get on with it, right? To get on out there and get after it. And so it's a great feeling. It's a great time of celebration, you know, when you graduate from whatever you're, you're striving to do. And so it's important to you, and that means it's a good thing. It's a positive thing. Certainly marriage is something that takes determination, right? You know, you may say, well, it's easy for me to, to love my husband or my wife. Well, certainly, but that doesn't mean it's always easy to work through problems and, and struggles, is it? You know, we have different uh, personalities, different temperaments, different ideas, and you may not always agree with your spouse on everything, right? So you have to work through those issues together. And when you love each other, you try to find a way to do that. You're determined to make it work, right? And so that's a great thing. It's a wonderful thing. Well, you hear about these folks that have been married for you know, 50, 60, 70 years. That's incredible, isn't it? You just don't hear a whole lot about that anymore, you know, but that's an amazing thing. 
that people uh, are so determined to make that happen, that they stay together and they work through issues and, and uh, have such long and happy marriage. And so that's a wonderful thing. Parenting takes a lot of determination, doesn't it? Yeah, we all uh, have been through that, right? If you've got kids, you know what I'm talking about this morning. You know? Why do we have kids anyway? You ever ask yourself that question? Did you ever ask yourself this question? Since God knew there was going to be trouble and lots of it, why did he decide to create Adam and Eve in the first place? Why did he do that? Did God need Adam and Eve? No, he didn't need them. He wanted them. He wanted to have that special and unique relationship with them. God is not incomplete. God is absolutely self-sufficient, right? He doesn't need anything or anyone. He wanted that relationship. He chose to do that because he has so much love and he wanted to share that love with others. Now, he knew there would be problems. He knew there would be disobedience. He knew there would be heartache. But he chose to create Adam and Eve because it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Isn't that why we have kids? We know there's going to be trouble. We know there's going to be difficult times. But most of us have a desire to have that very special and unique relationship with a child. Now, not everybody does, and that's fine. But most of us do. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And so you work through the issues. You, you do it, and you, you work out these problems, and you're determined to make it work because you love your children, and they love you. And so these things are very important. Uh, parenting. And so then other relationships can be a struggle. Outside your marriage, even uh, within your family, other family members, maybe outside your family, folks at work, other folks that you encounter from time to time. Sometimes it's, it's difficult, you know, to have a good and positive relationship with someone. But if it's important, then you're determined to make it work, right? And you can work through those issues. You can overcome it. And then finally, the Christian life. The Christian life is no exception. It's also important to be determined to succeed in your walk with the Lord. Now, the Bible is very, very clear that you cannot earn your way to salvation. There is nothing you can do to earn your way to heaven. It's a free gift. The Bible says we're saved by the grace of God through our personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You could never earn your way there. No way, right? But being faithful to the Lord and being obedient to the Lord and being a faithful disciple of Jesus does take a lot of work. You have to work at it. You have to be determined to succeed. And you can't let, let things discourage you and hinder you from working hard to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ. You go back and look at the faithful servants of the Lord in the Bible and you see that they went through some very, very difficult times, some very, very difficult struggles, probably times where they were very, very disillusioned, but they were determined to succeed in serving the Lord because it was important to them. And so they were determined to make it happen. So determination is very important. Jesus set the perfect example for us of being determined to do something that had to be done. He would not be deterred from going to the cross and laying down his life because he knew that that's the only way that you and I could go to heaven. It's the only way our sins could be forgiven. And that's how much he loves us. He was determined to give his life for all of us. Now, commitment, when you're truly committed to something, that's something you work from, right? You work away from that. You don't work toward it. Now, you can get better at it and you can be determined. You'll have ups and downs. But it has to begin with that moment of commitment, doesn't it? Genuine commitment. Anything that you're doing, you have to be committed to make it happen. You're going to take a job. You're going to go to school. You're going to get married. You're going to have a child. All these things begin with that commitment that you work away from. You don't work hard to get there. You work hard after you've started off with this determination to make it happen. And so you work away from it, not toward it. And so that's, that's important to understand, isn't it? That uh, it begins with that. Can you imagine a, a couple thinking about getting married? And maybe they haven't known each other very long. And, and can you imagine him saying something like this to his sweetheart? Saying, well, you know, I'm really not sure I'm in love with you. You know, I mean, I, we like each other and everything. And, you know, I think maybe we all just go ahead and get married and then we'll, uh, we'll work on it. And maybe we'll fall in love at some point and we'll see how this works out. You think she'd be real optimistic about that? And she might say the same thing to him. Well, you know, I really don't care much for you either, but, you know. 
getting kind of older and you know everything and I think I'd like to have kids and everything so why don't we just go ahead and let's just get married let's just get married and we'll see how this works out we'll love we'll we'll grow together we'll love to love each other we'll learn to love each other right well that sounds like it's going to start off really good doesn't it you can't start off that way you start off with a commitment and you work from it then when the difficult times come you still have that determination because the commitment is already there right you got to start with a commitment and so if you were truly committed to Jesus when you came to faith in him and if you're a Christian you were then you've got that foundation to build on right you work away from that you don't have to learn to love the Lord you already love him and when you go through tough times you don't stop loving him you may get discouraged you may be disillusioned you may not understand why the Lord's allowing something to happen in your life but you don't stop loving him you work through it you're determined to make it happen that's what Jesus did. I'm convinced. That's what they saw. That's why they were astonished. They couldn't believe. Look what he's doing. He's told us what's going to happen three times, and we're still going. And, and they were just amazed. So Jesus provided that determination to be faithful to the, to the Father. Secondly, faithfulness is always going to involve a struggle. There's always going to be a struggle involved. Sometimes things don't go smoothly. Sometimes there are obstacles to, to overcome. Verse 33, Jesus said, we're going up to Jerusalem. It says you're going up to Jerusalem because it was up on a hill. We're going up to Jerusalem. And he said, the Son of Man will be betrayed into the, the hands of the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. So here the third time he tells him this stuff. Notice he says the Son of Man is going to be betrayed. So Jesus knew all these things. He was going to be betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. He was going to be betrayed by his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane when he gets arrested and they all run for the hills, right? He was betrayed by Peter three times who denied that he even knew who Jesus was. And then ultimately, of course, he was betrayed by the crowd who cried out for him to be crucified, many of whom I'm convinced were shouting Hosanna just a few days earlier, right? And yet, how quickly their hearts turned. Now, not everybody, but some of them. And Jesus knew all these things were going to happen. He said, I'm going to be betrayed. You guys are going to betray me. You're going to forsake me. And so he knew that the struggle was coming. He knew it was going to be tough. He knew it was going to be hard. And then he says, I'm going to be mocked. They're going to spit on me. They're going to humiliate me. They're going to make fun of me. They're going to torture me. And he says, then they're going to kill me. I'm going to be put to death. All of us in our human nature have this desire to live, don't we? We have a desire to cling to life. Don't we all have that? Even when things are very, very difficult, we have a natural desire to want to, to live. It's always astounded me that, that people that go into prison for life without parole, it, it's always astounded me that they fight for that when the trial is going on. I think it was me. I think, well, I don't want to spend the rest of my life in prison with no hope of ever getting out. I think I'd rather just have the death penalty. But you hardly ever see that. Isn't that amazing? They always want to cling to life. They're, they're clinging to some kind of hope that somehow, some way, things are going to be okay and, and I, can, I can somehow have a, a meaning in life, you know. And, and so they cling to that. I saw the Menendez brothers uh, documentary on television yesterday and they were talking to these brothers about it. They said that very same thing. Well, you know, life without parole, it's going to be tough, you know. But one of the brothers said, I was scared to death when they were trying to decide whether we would have death or life without parole. And he very much wanted to live. And so there's just something within us that, that causes us to cling to life, to want to hang on to life. And so that's a good thing. That's a natural thing. Jesus had that too. And so he had to be scared to death. He was literally scared almost to death as to what was about to happen to him, knowing that he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to be tortured, and that ultimately he's going to be put to death, a terrible, horrible death on the cross. And so he knew the struggle was out in front of him, and yet nothing could stop him from going through with it. There's three things I'd like to mention here about the Christian life. First of all, there will be persecution. There will be persecution as a Christian. 
John 15, 20, Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you also. And so just get ready for it. You're going to face persecution as a Christian. Some of you have gone through some of that kind of stuff, right? Now, in our country, it, it's generally a lot different than some others that have gone to other countries where it's very, very difficult. Their, their very lives are at stake, right? I admire folks so much that go through that. But even here in our country, all of us as Christians face some element of persecution, don't we? Those who make fun of us because of our faith in Christ. Those who don't understand why we believe as we do. There are probably folks driving up and down 34th Street right now wondering, what are those people doing there? All those cars out there, what are they do? why are they doing that? You know, they don't have any understanding of what that's all about because they don't know the Lord. And so there are going to be those who will persecute us, who will, will ridicule us and make fun of us for our faith. And so just get ready for that. And Jesus said, just remember, they persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. So just, just get ready. It's going to happen. And then there are going to be, there's going to be those who oppose us. There's going to be opposition to what we're trying to do. Verse 34 of, of Matthew 10 Jesus said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, he said, but a sword, conflict. And he said, a man's enemies will be the members of his own household. And so Jesus said, you're going to have, you're going to have people opposed to you that are even members of your own family. Some of you can relate to that. I didn't really have that, you know. My family was very, very supportive of my decision to, to become a a Christian and to become a servant, to become a, a minister. But there are not, there are some families that simply don't have that attitude, right? I, I've heard people give testimony about how their families were totally opposed to their decision to follow Jesus. Especially when somebody's coming out of another religion, right? Wow, that's, that's amazing. Sometimes uh, children are uh, disowned by their parents because of their decisions to follow Christ. Isn't that amazing? Somebody would have the, the fortitude and the strength to overcome that and to, to follow Jesus anyway. And I'd like to think that I would do that as well. I think I would. I know I would, but it'd be tough, wouldn't it? And so there's going to be opposition. There are going to be those that are opposed to us simply because of what we believe and who we believe in and what we're trying to accomplish in this world. Well, Christianity is really uh, facing a lot of uh, opposition today, isn't it? Even in our culture. Things have changed so much. When you get to be a person of my age, you see how things have changed so dramatically in the last 30, 40, 50 years. It's just amazing how things have changed in our culture. And, you know, at one time we had a, a culture that was very, very much influenced heavily by Christianity, and that's changing so much nowadays. It seems like our influence is greatly diminishing and the culture has changed so much that there are many of those who are absolutely, totally opposed to the, the Bible and to Christ and the things that we believe in. And so we're fighting a very difficult battle today, aren't we? And so there's going to be opposition. Jesus said, just get ready. There's going to be those that persecute you because of your beliefs. There's going to be opposition to what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to do. And then there has to be this, uh, this attitude of self-denial where you deny yourself and instead you put God's will ahead of what you might want to do. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Some very, very important points there. Jesus said you've got to deny yourself. In, in other words, instead of just doing what you might want to do in your flesh, You've got to be willing to put my will first. You've got to be willing to do what I've called you to do instead of what you might want to do. And so you deny yourself, and you always put the Lord's will ahead of your own. And then he said, um, it may get to a point where you have to literally take up the cross and follow me. Now, when Jesus said that, they, they completely and fully understood exactly what he meant. Back in those days... The cross meant execution, right? That was the Roman form of executing criminals. And so when Jesus said, you, you're going to have to take up the cross and follow me, he's talking about giving your life for something. You've got to be so devoted to this, he said, that you're willing to give your very life in order to follow me and be one of my disciples. Well, that's true devotion, isn't it? 
That you would die for, for the Lord Jesus Christ? That you would die for the cause of Christ? And so we must be willing to do that. Sometimes we, we stumble and we fall and we get it all wrong. Sometimes it happens very suddenly, very unexpectedly. Kind of like Peter. You know, when Peter, do you think Peter fully realized what he was about to do, even though Jesus warned him? Isn't that amazing? Jesus told him what he was going to do. Three times he said, you're going to deny me. That you even know me. And even knowing that, he was, he was so afraid and things happened so quickly and this was such an impulsive thing that he didn't even realize what he was doing, I'm convinced. And three times he said, I don't even know him. I don't know what you're talking about. And then he heard that rooster crowing. Imagine how he felt when he fully realized what he had done. That he had disappointed the Lord and he did the very, very thing Jesus told him he was going to do. The Bible says he went out and did what? He wept bitterly because of what he had done. He felt like, boy, how could I ever be of service to the Lord now? I've, I've gone so far now, it's over for me. So he decided to just go back to fishing. Yet the Lord was not through with him. The Lord went after him. The Lord called him back into service. Reinstated him, I guess you would say, as one of his primary leaders in the ministry the cause of Christ. You know, the Bible doesn't mention this, but there's a tradition, a biblical-based tradition. It's not in the Scriptures, but it's always been surrounding the Scriptures that Peter was crucified upside down. Have you heard that? That Peter was going to be put to death because of his faith, because of his devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they came to him and said, well, okay, we're going to take you out now and we're going to crucify you. He said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord was. Would you please crucify me upside down? Now, we don't know for sure that happened, but it kind of sounds in character for him, doesn't it? Isn't that amazing how far he came from that moment of denying Jesus three times to being crucified on that cross upside down? You see, he was determined. It was a struggle for him, just like it was for all the disciples. All of them were put to death. The only exception might be John, and he spent a good time in exile right on the island of Patmos. And so these guys were all persecuted and ultimately put to death because of their faith in Jesus. But they were determined to be successful in their ministries. Now do you understand why they were astonished when they were looking at Jesus? Now do you understand how they found the courage to continue moving forward when tough times came and they didn't give up? They had a perfect example before them of the Lord Jesus Christ. You got to be determined. There is going to be a struggle, but you can overcome with the Lord's help. And then there's another element here that just really speaks to my heart, and that's the element of hope. Hope, optimism. Hope in the Bible doesn't mean that, well, I hope this happens. Hope in the Bible means you're very, very optimistic and convinced that it is going to happen. It's, it's faith. It's having faith that something is going to come about. Jesus said, guys, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be rejected by the religious leaders. They're going to whip me and mock me and spit on me and torture me. And they're going to put me to death. But he didn't stop there, did he? He said, and in three days, I'm going to come back. I'm going to rise from the dead. You see the, you see the optimism there? He knew that he was going to come back from the dead. Hope is such a powerful thing, isn't it? It's a motivator that keeps us going. He knew that he was going to be successful in laying down his life for us. And he knew that he was going to be resurrected. He knew that the price was going to be paid. He knew that all of us were going to be saved. That believe in him and trust in him. And so hope is really kind of what keeps us going, isn't it? You know, when my dad found out he had cancer, it was a very difficult time for our family and a diff very difficult struggle for my mother. And I've always admired her so much for what she went through and taking care of him as he went through chemotherapy and then 
There was a time when it was in remission and then it came back and more chemotherapy and all of that. And I saw him go through such a very, very difficult struggle. But I remember when he first found out that he had this, this terrible disease, everybody kept telling us, well, you've got to have hope. You've got to cling to hope. You know, you've got to just try and be confident that things are going to be okay. And the nurses said that. The doctors said that. It's very important for your, your healing, they said, to be optimistic, to have hope, to, to look beyond this. And, and he did that. That helped, helped him, I think, get through all those terrible treatments and all of that. And then, you know, ultimately came the time when he realized that there was not going to be a healing, at least not in this life. And, but his faith had grown tremendously, and he knew that he was going to be with Jesus. He knew what was going to happen to him. And he had hope in eternal life. And that was a tremendous help to him as well, and to our family also. Hope is a powerful thing, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing. I remember telling my dad, you know, Dad, you know, this is tough, and I know it's hard for you, it's hard for us, but we're going to be with you very, very soon. Very, very soon. I said, I think it's going to be just like that for you, and we're going to be with you. And I really believe that. That hope, that optimism, knowing where you're going to go, knowing where you're going to spend eternal life, that is so powerful, isn't it? And so we need to have that hope and that optimism in our hearts. When, when you're going through a tough time and things are just not going right and you get so discouraged, if you know Jesus as your Savior, just remember where you're going to spend all eternity, right? All of a sudden those problems just begin to melt away, don't they? They really don't amount to anything, do they? When you put it in perspective with eternal life. And so we need to have hope. Paul knew what that was all about. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13 Paul, of course, was the one that initially persecuted the church. He hunted down Christians, took them back before the religious leaders, knowing they would be put to death. It was Paul who was watching the clothes when the, the guys were stoning Stephen to death. Remember that? Gave, uh, gave his, you know, his uh, consent to what they were doing and everything. So this guy was going about as far in the opposite direction as God wanted him to go as you could possibly go. He was opposed to everything that Jesus stood for until he had that encounter with Jesus on the Damascus Road. And so his life was completely changed, 180 degrees. And notice what Paul said about these things. He said, there's one thing I do, he said, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He says, there's one thing I do, but any good preacher can find at least four things he did, right? There's four things that have, have to do with this passage right here. First of all, he said, I'm forgetting about the past. I put all that behind me. All that negative stuff. I used to persecute the church. I used to put Christians to death. I was totally opposed to the cause of Christ. And now he says, hey, that's all water under the bridge. That's behind me. Imagine if he let the devil continually remind him of that day after day after day after day that he would never be able to accomplish all that he did for the cause of Christ, right? He said, God has helped me to do something. I've put all that behind me. That's all in the past. It's, for, it's forgiven. It's forgotten. I'm moving on. Okay? Then he says, I look forward. He says, I, I strain toward what is ahead. He says, I just keep on moving forward. I'm just focused on what I'm trying to accomplish. And I just keep on moving in the right direction for the Lord. And he says, I work toward the goal. I press on toward the goal. The goal, of course, is being faithful to the Lord. He's already a Christian, so he's not trying to get saved. You don't work for that. He already had that. He says, I am pressing toward the goal of being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And to be obedient to Him. And then he said, I'm, I'm working toward the goal of winning the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. In other words, he was expecting to win the prize. The prize, of course, is eternal life and all the rewards that we're going to reap because of our walk with the Lord, right? And our faithfulness to Him. 
And so he says, I, I'm expecting that to happen. I know that that's going to happen. That someday, when I come to the end of my life, I'm going to be with the Lord. And I'm going to be rewarded for all the things that I did for the cause of Christ. You think these guys knew a little bit about what it means to be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ? They were very faithful, weren't they? So when you're discouraged and you're uh, struggling to do what is right, it's hard to be faithful sometimes. Understand, Jesus told us it's going to be a struggle, but you be determined. You be determined to succeed. And you hang on to that hope that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord Jesus Christ is going to get you through it. Amen? He's going to get you through it. Sometimes it's tough. It's a challenge to be a faithful Christian. The devil never relents, does he, in trying to, to pull us down and to discourage us. But we've got everything in the world to be optimistic about. We have eternal life. We have the knowledge of, of, of the fact that all of our sins have been forgiven. And we have the Lord encouraging us each and every day in what he wants us to do. If God be for us, who can be against us, right? So be determined to make it happen. Well, let's all stand and pray. Lord, I'm sure there's some folks here this morning that are going through some kind of a struggle. Lord, it may be a health problem. It may be a job-related issue. It may be relationship-oriented. Lord, it could be a struggle to do your will, to be faithful to you. Lord, help us to gain encouragement through looking at your perfect example that you've set for us this morning of being determined to do the right thing, clinging to that hope, realizing and expecting everything to turn out just as you said it would. So Lord, when we get discouraged and when we're troubled, just remind us of what lies before us. Give us grace, give us optimism, give us joy, and give us strength to continue to do the right thing and to be determined to be faithful in our walk with you. Lord, we thank you for loving us so much that you gave your life for us. Lord, help us and strengthen us to give our lives back to you each and every day. We pray and ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.